Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. It's Mom at Home on a Friday. We have another Creator's Corner for you today. I'm very excited because this is something I really enjoy, our topic today. We're going to be looking at music notation, specifically music notation software. And, you know, I'm a big computer nerd, and I love having everything right here in front of me and being able to uh, not have to use pen and paper. Um, I've often wondered, you know, when you look at a printed piece of music, how does that get mu- How does that? How do all the notes get in place? What what happens? What's uh, going on behind the scenes? And uh, here to kind of share uh, their experiences with using music notation, uh, we have John Denny, one of our volunteers, and Mr. Bill, who will be guiding our conversation today. And I know, I know, Mr. Bill, you use music notation software in addition to uh, Mr. Denny, and uh, you want to get us kicked off for that event. What what music software will we be exploring today? That sounds great, BJ. Today we're going to uh, talk about a music software called Finale. Uh, it's uh, made by uh, Make Music, uh, but as you pointed out when we were getting ready to do this session, uh, there are all kinds of uh, software platforms available for music notation. And I think we'll let you address that a little later on because I think you're, you're more familiar with those. In fact, uh, the one that I use personally here at home is uh, one called uh, MuseScore. And it's a free version, so you can pick that up anywhere. You can pick that up off the the web. There you go. Perfect. Well, uh, you uh, did introduce our guest today, but uh, I'll give you just a little background on uh, on John Danny. John is uh, one of our newer volunteers, uh, but as I would like to say, he immediately embraced his role as a visitor experience specialist. And uh, when you come in to see us at the museum, very good chance you'll see John there and he'll be sharing his knowledge of our uh, of our galleries there at the Museum of Making Music. So welcome, John. Thank you for taking your time to be with us this afternoon. Well, thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to first start off with a shout out to you and Carolyn and all the rest of the staff there. About, and just thank you for the great job that you do at the Museum of Making Music. And, and thank you for welcoming me, welcoming me in and uh, giving me the chance to be part of this experience. So, so it's great, so I thank you. So we'll get into this topic of music notation. And I think, you know, music notation is actually, the need for it has been going on for thousands of years. And I saw a really good quote uh, from a guy about 2000 years ago. And he said, if a sound only exists in the mind, it can be lost forever. And that is the challenge I think all songwriters have is because you have these, these melodies that come into your head and if you don't capture them in some way, either write them down on notation or record them, well, they can be lost forever. And so uh, today we're gonna talk about a way to capture it on, on, on sheet music, essentially. And so I'm going to turn my screen around and I will show you what we call a lead sheet. Awesome, uh, John, and if okay. you would, uh, go ahead and explain exactly what lead sheet means. Okay, now there's different forms of formats of music, of sheet music, of course. And a lead sheet is a very basic form that has all the essential elements of the song. It has the melody, it has the, the harmony in the form of chords, and then it has all of the lyrics. And then it gives you any other information about the copyright date and the title and, and the, the composer, or the songwriter. But it's used primarily for uh, like say you were in a band and you wrote a song and you wanted to to get the band to play the song. Well, what you would do is you could give them a lead sheet and then they would have the melody. Well, as in the past, though, a lot of us were in bands and, and maybe you wrote a song and you'd give the other band members a, a, a typewritten or handwritten sheet of lyrics with the chords over the top of them. And that's about all they got. Well, with something like this, at least you are getting the melody line. So this is really good for a lead singer uh, who's learning a new song and they can go back and practice this and you don't have to keep reviewing Oh no, that's not quite the way it went. It went like this. They've got it written out in front of them. And so the lead sheet can do that. It can, um, it's only one staff, it's one instrument. It plays uh, consecutively. Now, if you remember Dr. Mark Riley's, um, um, if everyone online uh, remembers Dr. Mark Riley's presentation about two weeks ago, uh, he was showing uh, another template, which was more of a score for, for an orchestra. And it had all these lines represented individual instruments. And he had, I think he, how I many have like 20 or so lines of different instruments playing at the same time. And so 
in, in that type of music, sheet music, all the lines represent a different instrument and they're all playing consecutively or simultaneously. And if you'll look at some scores like from early Vivaldi and things like that, it's just, it's just mind boggling that this guy wrote this stuff out by hand and it came right out of his head. And it's just thousands of notes because if you listen to some of his violin pieces, there are just so many notes. And so that's this really an incredible piece. Well, today, much simpler piece. It's got one line, one instrument, and gives all the essential elements. So what my plan for today was, I was going to show a completed lead sheet that I have that I wrote some time back and just be able to identify some of the elements of it. And then what I'm going to do is close this down and open up a blank sheet of paper and, sh and show some people how you drop some notes into uh, the, into the manuscript form. And since we have some challenges with, uh, with copyrights, I, I thought I just wrote a little original piece that we can work with for a little workshop. Okay, so let's get started. So if we look at this song that I wrote, and if anybody's wondering about who is Leslie, Leslie's my wife of 35 years plus. And so I wrote this for her several years ago. And so if you look at the sheet, if you go over to the very left, uh, we'll start here and identify these symbols. And, and, and these symbols are also showing some of the essential elements of the song. Well, this stately looking character that, that's right here, and what I'm going to do, I am going to uh, blow this up just a little bit so people can see it a little better. And so what you've got here is um, this stately character is called a clef. And this is a treble clef. And this is the clef you usually use for a, um, a lead sheet because it's got all of the notes that really are, are included in a melody. And a clef identifies which notes are on your staff. And this is a staff, it's five parallel lines and, and, um, and then four spaces. And I think everybody who's ever at some time in their life, they've heard the mnemonic of where the notes are placed on the treble clef, which is every good boy does fine, or E, G, B, D, and F. And then in the center, maybe they haven't heard that one as much, that's F, A, C, E, so that's face. And so you've got seven notes that, that are represented on this staff. Now, the thing is, there are actually 12 notes available to work with when you work with a song. Now, which I've always thought was incredible that, that all the millions of songs that have been written over time uh, were done so with only 12 notes, which is different combinations and timings and everything. So, um, so how do you get, if you've only got seven natural notes, how do you get any other notes? Well, the next group you see is the key signature. And this is telling you what key you're in. And this particular song is in the key of D major. And the key of D major has two sharps. It's got a sharp on the F and a sharp on the C. So F, A, C, so right here. And so whenever you play one of these notes, when you are in this key, you don't play the natural form of say an F, you play the sharp form. And a sharp form is about a half step higher. So you vary the pitch of the established natural notes with these accidentals and every key has a different set of accidentals, except for the key of C. Key of C, you don't use any. Key of C essentially is just written in, in the, all of the white keys on a piano where you don't use any of the black keys which represent the sharps and flats. So this tells you what key it's in. Now, for those of you who've been in bands or, or you, you, you've listened to a band or you've been jamming with somebody and you say, let's play this song. A popular song and the first question somebody asks is what key and well this doesn't really matter as much as you you want to know what what chord do you start start on and in this case you, you usually start on the key in in the key you're in with the first chord should be a d major chord now that's not a 100 percent a rule all the time in fact the beatles were really famous for um not starting on the key they were in, they would start on, on some other chords. And then they would eventually get back to the key they were in and get to that chord. The, the song Help is a very good example of uh, where they start in C sharp minor. And then they work on up the scale. And then they finally get to a high A, which is the actual key the song is in. Then they have to come back down to that. So those are the exceptions. So I'd say the more of a, a rule would be the first chord would be the first chord of the verse. And so that's what you usually hear, hear keys for, but the, the main purpose of keys is to give you more notes to play with. So the next 
piece you come over for is the, these two stacked fours. And this is your time signature. This is really the rhythm of the song. And if you look at this one, four, four time is the most common time signature there is. In fact, they call it common time. And you may see, instead of seeing two fours here, you might see a stylized C uh, that'll be here instead because that stands for common time. There are other times, which we'll look at when we start setting up uh, our, our manuscript from scratch and we have to select a time, we'll look at your other options that you can get. Now, the other thing on this lead sheet that, that, that Finale enables you to do is to give what's called a pickup or a lead in. Some people call this a lead in. It's just a couple of notes. They don't really have to adhere to the, the four four time. And that's why you see they, they're, there's not as many notes here as there are here, because this guy is the sheriff. Uh, he, he, he controls the, the, the song. And whereas in the key signatures, you may have a little leeway and you may have a workaround by, if you don't wanna really play an F sharp in the song, you can put this little uh, notation over here. It looks like a box kite. You put it in front of the F and then that naturalizes it. So it would be a natural F again. So you have some little workarounds here, but now with the key signature, this key signature is telling that, that the beat duration is a quarter note. And then it's telling you there's four quarter notes within each measure or bar. Uh, when I was trained in music many years ago, we call this a bar. And then somewhere along the line, I didn't really get the memo, so people started calling this a measure. So if I show my age and, and call this a bar at some time, you'll know that I'm in a, me a measure. But Finale calls them measures, so that's the, the nom nomenclature we'll use for today. So if you look at, we need four beats here in this measure. And if you look over here, these are the different notes that we'll look at later, and they all make up, you don't need to put all quarter notes. Even though we said that the beat duration of the, of the time signature was a quarter note, you can put any combination of notes as long as you don't exceed four beats to this measure. So this is essentially um, the, the, the lead sheet. The, the other thing that I wanted to point out is uh, these little, this little repeat section here. Now, if you've ever read from a church hymnal, you use these a lot because they will put the, all the verses are pretty much exactly the same melody line. And if your verses are the same melody line, then you can just keep repeating the verses uh, instead of having to string them out. I don't know if you've ever got, bought a piece of sheet music for a song you really wanted to learn how to play, and the uh, composer, the songwriter, uh, decided to just link all the verses together, one after the other, and you end up with about eight pages of sheet music, whereas in this case, you can get by with about one and a half sheets. So it's, it's more of an economy thing than anything. And the pickup enables you to slightly vary the lead-in to every, every verse. And so this one will have this lead-in, and then if we get over to where the, the other side of this, which would be the same double bars and the dots, it'll be on this side of the bar and it will, it'll be further down in the music. We won't go look at it, but it will then, once you get to that, then you'll bounce back to the beginning and you just keep going over until you get to the end and you'll finish up the song. So this is essentially the lead sheet. And so at this point, maybe we'll just stop and uh, see if there's any questions so far. John, let me jump in. Uh, I've okay. got a question for you. Uh, okay, so you've uh, done a great job of explaining the concept of a pickup measure. And I think, BJ, you being a drummer, you're real familiar with that because you count down the songs. Quite often, you'll play a little fill going into the song. That would be your pickup measure. Most yeah. most of my life is, is in pickup land, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all right. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily have to adhere to the four beats in the measure because it's sort of like a pre-measure. It's exactly. like, uh, well, I'm not a sports guy really, but uh, do you sort of like the quarterback giving the countdown before they actually hack the ball, yeah? That's yeah. exactly right. Okay, so yeah, now so you... you can see this one is only actually one beat. It's only two, two eighth notes that are tied together. And then it leads in. And um, you actually identify in finale uh, wh how many beats you want in your pickup measure. And then it puts it in. Now, sometimes you can put a pickup measure in with a complete measure and you would put rests in. And that's one thing I didn't mention that whenever you're putting your notes in, you have to have four beats, whether they're sounded or not. Now, sometimes you won't sound one of the beats, but then you'll have to put in a rest. And that's what this symbol right here is. This is in lieu of uh, a quarter note. So that's, that's really the, 
the, the way the pickup would go, you, you can either do it this way or the other way. But I think this way just looks a little neater because then you don't start off with a couple of rests in, in, in your first measure. I agree with you, John. Uh, and at the repeat sign that takes you back to the beginning of the song for your second verse, you're going to have those pickup notes there anyway. Now, you said, uh, yeah, go ahead and show us that. But uh, okay. while you're getting there, let me yes. uh, uh, point something else out. You said in that pickup measure, it's actually one beat, but I see two notes there. Could you maybe, uh -huh. maybe yeah, so, so go one into that and explain that? Yeah, so, so one beat is, is actually the duration of one beat in 4-4 four, four time is a quarter note. And those two notes are actually two eighth notes. So you told it you want one beat to be there, but you, you spread it out over two shorter notes. And that's how you got there. Okay. Well, what you're doing but, is you're, you're subdividing notes then. And you can theoretically do that uh, at infinity, right? Uh, absolutely. You can go to eighth notes, uh, you know, 16th notes, 32nd notes, 64th notes, you know, and they get, they, and they get, you put more and more together and they're all quicker. And so their, their time is very slow in, in my, in most of the music I write, um, I, I don't use anything, but, but anything shorter than say a, a, an eighth note, which is just half of a quarter note. But if you look at some of those Vivaldi compositions, I was telling you about, Oh my gosh, he's got he's got some 32 notes in there that are all strung together. And when you think about a violin that's just really just just going to town, uh, you, you can think about all those notes that he's playing, and you have to write everyone in. Uh, so now I, I went to the to the other part of the music where we're we're going back to the beginning, and then this is another pickup here. But in this case, I've got a I'm, I'm just in the music. I've got a measure, and I'm I'm playing along, and I'll want to rest for a, a, a period before I get into this. You know, when you write music, everything is, is not just pushed together. You like to have, uh, I've heard some people describe, you want a little air around your music. And so this would allow you to um, you know, have a little air and then go back into the next verse. Then this would be essentially the pickup here. And then this symbol tells you to go back to the beginning and there you would pick up the second verse. And then you would come back through using the same uh, melody line, you'd come back through again. And then when you got at the end of the second verse, then your pickup line's a little different. See, like if you'll notice in, in the first pickup, I had two beats and uh, I had, excuse me, I had two notes and there were two eighth notes. In this one, I have three eighth note, eight, three eighth notes because I've got three words in the lyric. And in the last one, I just have one. And then this one, though, I, I'm, I'm going to drag it out a little bit longer. I'm not going to step up into it. I'm just going to leave a quarter note there. And so this will be my next lead into the third verse. And then whenever you come back through the third verse, you just go all the way and then you pick up the very ending. So you've got like this ending to your song that will be played then. And so it's really a very economical way, I think, to, to, to write the music. Okay. Right, John, that's very uh, succinct and to the point. Uh, in looking at this, uh, as a guitar player, for instance, you could hand me this and you start singing that melody with the pickup every, and then mm -hmm. I know right there on that word now, and then I'm starting to play that D chord and mm -hmm. onward from there. Very, sim very, like I say, direct and to the point way of uh, sharing your music with people and making it accessible to a larger uh, range of musicians. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I, I think. Uh, any, do we have any questions from the? You know, audience? and I'm 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 sorry, Bill. I'm not able to to shoot our chat the way we normally do because of a couple changes in the software now. But uh, yeah, one question from Joe. Uh, how about can you show chord inversions with Finale? Are you able to do that? Yes, you can. All right. So if I go to my to my chord tool, and it's really not formatted for that. In fact, on my when I show the next song. I'll show you how all that. And so I can actually look at the chord and I can say, show the fretboard. And then if I want to do an inversion of this song, say it puts these in. And if anybody, you know, has, has ever bought a music book and uh, for like, uh, you know, a very complex song and you'll see the first chord is a D. Well, that's not the, the inversion or that's not the, the voicing of that chord, but they just put them in like that. So they start off with the very simple ones. And then what you can do is you can go here and you can edit the fretboard and you can go up here now and put any one of the, you can change this 
into different inversions or notes. And then whenever you go back to your chords, your chord diagram will give the inversion that you wanted. That is uh, really spectacular. They've really thought this through uh, with this program. And I'm going to point out just a couple other things, uh, uh, John, so that uh, everybody watching is very aware. In the museum, as, as uh, you know, it's a hands-on museum, and we do have some chordal instruments, mandolin, guitar, ukulele, and so forth. And at those stations, you'll see a chord sheet that looks very much like what you have right here with the actual chord symbols and the diagram for how you pl place your fingers to play those different chords. And that's, that's what we're looking at here. One more thing, and then I'll let you take it back over. Um, and that's the fact that, of course, in the museum, we also give a nod to the sheet music uh, of, of yesteryear and how important that was uh, for songwriters to get their music out and be heard, so much more so then because they didn't have, you know, the internet and social media. They couldn't just say, here's my new song and post it for the world to hear. If you wanted people to hear the, uh, your song, you literally had to have them buy the sheet music. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And, and you know, in today's uh, songwriter, when you write a song, you can then, you can store it in, as a recording which uh, that's, on, that's only been possible for about the last 100 years. And so before 100 years, everyone had to have a skill similar to yours where you could actually sit down and just look at these notes and you can hear them in your head and see what they are. Well, now I think uh, uh, science and technology has made it so easy for us. A lot of us have, have really gotten a little lazy and, they, and we don't have that skill anymore. And so, What's really great about this software is it enables someone who doesn't really have a trained ear where they can look at this and, and hear it in their head. Like I'm sure you can look at this right now and you can, you can just play it out in your head. Well, when someone who doesn't have that skill level, when you put the notes in, you don't know what they sound like. And this software enables you to go back and hear them. And I think playback is the number one advantage of computer software. Absolutely true. And it's funny when you said that, John, I started looking at your melody and it's bouncing around in my head there. <laughs> um, but something I've said for years, uh, ever since I got into the not only computer notation, but the MIDI world where you can create literally orchestras in your home studio, is we live in an era where we're so blessed by the fact that we do have this instant ability to hear what we've written. You know, think of the guys like Beethoven. Uh, Bach, uh, Schubert, so many amazing composers that came down the pipeline. Now, they were hearing the music in their head, uh, and they would write, as you pointed out, these huge orchestral works, but if they couldn't find an orchestra to actually play them, they never actually get to hear them live in the room. So we, we live in a pretty blessed era. We really do. And you just, I, it, it's, it's just staggering for me to even imagine somebody like Beethoven and Vivaldi and all those guys that, that have those, all of those instruments playing simultaneously. And they wrote all that out and, and their ears had never vibrated with that sound before. It was all in their head. And like you said, they had to go out and hire uh, an orchestra in order to finally hear it, you know, and, and it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think the best gigs were if you were the sort of the king's personal uh, composer, because you were pretty well guaranteed you were going to hear the music uh, played by the King's Orchestra. But, uh, you know, otherwise, the guys were guys and gals that were just writing music because they heard it in their heads. It was 50-50. Uh, maybe I'll get to hear this. Maybe I won't. John, I want to look at one more thing before we go on to your blank uh, score. I know you're going to show us how to actually create this lead sheet. Yep. Uh, yeah. Be hey, I, just some more quick questions. Joe's got some really advanced like theory questions going on out here, and he's got uh, one that I just spotted. Is like, can you correct parallel fifths and parallel octaves? I don't know if that's a, a feature specific to uh, finale. If it's a nice little kind of a, you know, it, it, obviously in it, this is more of an advanced music theory uh, concept when you're creating lyrical melodies or lines and your root follows that you know you 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 follow octaves along it's kind of something that you don't want to do 
in order to create a little bit more variety in a score, um, I wonder if uh, Finale offers the feature where it recognizes when you're doing that. If you if you're not you know if you ha- have a bad habit like some drummers I know do, um, when you're creating a, a score and you have a bad habit of doing um, parallel octaves or parallel fifths when you're writing your music, if there's a little feature in there that will allow you to say, hey, you got this uh, trend going on, you might want to diverge from that you might want to have try this note instead of uh, this note in your oh. composition is it does it have any helpful tools like that in there you know bj i've got i'll answer like mark twain said i was able to answer immediately i, I said i don't know <laughs> <So>. <laughs> again that was some that's a pretty uh in, in, that's some pretty advanced uh, uh uh music theory going on there from joe i, th- I appreciate his uh yeah. his depth of knowledge there i, I recognize that and i i, I I guess I can I, I can see that how helpful that would be if you if you plunk down a uh, something in your toolkit that would say hey you might have these uh, parallel notes going for a little more you know variety yeah may we recommend not doing that so I mean I can see how a tool like that would be very useful especially in notation software and I I wouldn't be surprised if it did exist somewhere in there I like I was telling you earlier I use a a, a free notation software called MuseScore and I haven't had the chance to dive, uh, do a deep dive on its feature set, but uh, now with that question that Joe asked, I might like uh, purposefully write some uh, parallel uh, eighths and fifths to see if there's a tool in there that would, will, will compensate and recognize that to just to kind of play around with that. That's a great question. Mm-hmm. That is a great question, and uh, I, I use it primarily for putting, you know, putting my just scoring what I've got and not really composing anything in the program. That would be a great tool. Uh, you you know that would be something like a collaborator would would that, that would be the good so- good name of the software I think collaborator that, that had a feature like that right yeah uh, you know yeah I know um, I think back on you know the the song uh, help again uh, when John Lennon wrote that and um, when he brought it to Paul McCartney for collaboration Paul said uh, it's kind of boring because you stay on the same C sharp for the entire verse and you think about the song. You sing the entire verse on a C sharp. Now they've got chord changes going on around it, but it's, it's the same note. And so he suggested that he and George deliver the lyrics to John in harmony ahead of him, which would give it a nice little twist and kind of liven it up a little bit. So, so that's a collaboration move there, isn't it? That, that's a, a amazing that they, they came up with things like that. Right, right. Okay, so any other questions we got? We want to uh, go around and take this one down. And I'm going to close this one. And any changes I did, I'll keep them. And now I just want to show you uh, a few features of Finale. Uh, Whenever you first open it up, uh, you get this launch window. But you can also come back to this launch window at any time. And for the person who's just getting started in this, there's a wealth of tutorials here. Uh, with quick start videos, user manual, uh, tutorial gri- guides. Uh, there's all kinds of learning centers here. Uh, so so I, I would recommend uh, looking into these. I've looked at a few of these myself. And then when you go to set up a document, uh, you can do a setup wizard. Uh, I, you know, this one is kind of like, for me, it's more like a setup warlock because I let, the times I've used it, I got into some really weird formatting changes <laughs> that I couldn't get out of. <laughs> so, so um uh, you can go to templates, and just to show you this real quick, um, uh, these are all the templates. And if we look at our orche- orchestral template, this was this would be kind of like let's look at a um, an, an orchestra, a full orchestra. Here we go. This is kind of like what um, Mark had, and this has all the instruments going across, and and you would write each part, and then you would continue this on another sheet, and and these things were literally books. And you just, uh, because you only got four bars, you know, for, for a music that, that, that could last, you know, for, for how many bars. So anyway, this would be one of those templates. And, yeah. um, right, and so then if we can close it down. I like that template and, feature because I can only imagine how long that would take to try and, you know, if you're going to, you, I would be dreading creating a score if I had to add every individual part to it. I'm like, okay, piccolo one, piccolo two, okay, timpani, mm-hmm. snares, and mm-hmm. having to go through that process. I can't imagine how long that would take without the template there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. 
would take you uh, quite a bit of time, and each time you open up uh, a new template to create a new song. Uh, again, to the credit of this program, they thought these things all the way through. Uh, backing up a little bit to your question about parallel fifths and parallel octaves, um, I'm not familiar with that, uh, whether it's a feature or not either, but I do know that uh, Finale offers uh, arranging. Uh, you can say, I've written this line for a, for a big band. Boom, it'll pop an arrangement in there for you. Wow, yeah, it's it's a great program, and it's it's kind of I guess the industry standard. I think there's another one called Sibelius that's kind of giving it a run for its money, but it has about everything you would ever do. Now that's a bit pricey, and so that's why I think BJ is going to give at the end of this uh, program, he's going to give some alternatives uh, if somebody wanted to get started uh, that they can do for very little or no money. Uh, but anyway, this is kind of everything you would ever want. Uh, including uh, it has a built-in orchestra of instruments. I think it's got about a hundred instruments that you can play as well. So let's go ahead and uh, dive into our little exercise, our little workshop. And so as I was looking at the templates, you know, really what I like to do is I, I, I use the default document because then you just make a few changes with that. And I like the way the fonts are and everything. And so to save a little bit of time, I, I went ahead and uh, took the, the default one and I went ahead and, and made our, uh, our exercise. So I wrote this little piece of music about two weeks ago and um, because I wanted to have an original piece and, and I, I, I call it, we call her mom, I'm doing a little, little play on the acronym for the Museum of Making Music because that's the way we do refer to the, to the museum, a lot of people do. And so uh, we'll start off with this, with this sheet and the only thing I've really done is I've, I've added uh, the name and I always put in my, my music here, words and music by me. And then down at the bottom, it has an area for you to declare your copyright. And I would recommend anytime you do this to go ahead and declare your copyright. Now this doesn't register your copyright, but it does declare it. And so you have the copyright from this point on, but you know, someone could come along and take your music from you if you didn't register and you couldn't go back and defend the date that you're able to do that. Yeah, so just a little a little public service announcement there. You're, <laughs> you're, you're twisting my brain around, John, because this is this is the first time I've never ever assigned a gender to the museum before. <laughs> I'm I'm having my you're twisting my brain. The, the museum's always <laughs> been gender neutral for me. I'm like, oh no, now I'm gonna, so now I'm gonna have to process this differently. Right, right. Or or you can just uh, forget it all. After. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's get started. Um, so we're going to start back over on the left here, or um, from at the beginning, and we'll look at we'll, we'll use the treble clef again. Oh, I wanted to show you something, and I'm going to uh, increase this a little bit. Okay, now this treble clef, I had said that it it tells you which notes are going to go on the lines, and it does that because it's actually called the G clef. And if you look right where this little curly Q is, it's surrounding the G note. So it tells you to put your G note on that line and then you add your other notes in alphabetical order. So you start here with a G, then you, then you just start A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And so after G, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then you do it in descending order as well. So you go down to F and to E and then to D. And so it, it gives you a reference point by just telling you one note. And so, but most people know the mnemonic and so they know where the notes are anyway. And, but that, I think this is just something from history, a little bit of trivia that maybe people didn't know. And the next thing you wanna do is your time signal. Well, actually, the next thing after this, we said this tells you the, the seven notes and where they're located. But what key are you in? This might change things. And so I am going to then go up here to this little box that says the key signature tool. Then I'm going to select the first measure. And then here's all the keys that you can work in. Now it defaults to the key of C major and it has no sharps or flats. And I, I recommend if you're first taking your songs that have only been maybe on a recording and, and you don't really know what the individual notes are, you might want to write it in C major because that's just using the white keys on a piano if you want to pick out what the notes are in your, in your melody line if you've never really written them down before. And then uh, you can just easily transpose anything into another key. 
So if I just select G major, which is actually the key for it, it's going to automatically set this up in the key of G major, and this has one sharp. Okay, so so this this sharp uh, is on the on the F, and so if I every F that I encounter in my composition will have to have a sharp on it, unless I go over here and use this little box kite called a natural and put that in front of it, and then that will change it back to a natural note. But you also you you also have to look at the uh, not only the F up here but the F down here. And so you have to remember that even though it's not denoted here, any F is done in sharp. And then, so, so now we've got our key. And so now we move over to the time signature. And, and like I said, this is, this is the, um, the sheriff. This is the, this is the guy who determines uh, the rules of the game as far as timing goes. And that's kind of the way I look at, at, at when I score something, I look at it as a big game. You've got your playing field here. Uh, you've got your your game pieces, which are over here, and your notes, and your vests, and and your accidentals, and everything. And then you've got um, then then you've got your rules. Well, the first thing this rule is is pretty much pretty hard fast. It sets it out, but it, it you can change it, and and you can change it with the next rule, which is the key. But this guy, you can't change him. So let me show you how this works. So if we go back, we just talked about this a couple of times but we'll talk about it again. Um, if I look at this one, and this, these are all the key signatures that you can use. Now we're in common time, which is four, four, but there are other times that we could come as well. And so if we wanna edit this time signature, if I didn't wanna start out in this, this is the way it works. So this is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. This is the time cadence for four, four time. Now, if I wanted to do drop it one beat, three, four time is, well, you've got the same duration of the bass unit, which is the quarter note, but there's only three of them there. And then the way the cadence for this is, is one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And this is of course the waltz uh, cadence. And then the only other one that, that people really use, and they really don't use this one that much anymore, uh, is the, the two, four time. And in this one, the, the, the beat cadence would be one, two, one, two, or left, right, left, right. And you guessed it, this is the March um, time signature. But we're gonna stay with good old 4-4 four, four common time uh, because that's what most songs are written in. Okay, so now we are ready to drop some notes in. We've got all of our rules there. We, we've got the, the sheet set up, we're in a key, and now we're gonna start. Now there's three ways that you can actually put notes in in finale. The first one, and if you look at your tools, it lists all the uh, things like that, plus other things. But the first one is called hyperscribe. And hyperscribe is what you would do with this. You would hook up a, an, a MIDI keyboard, and then you could actually play your song at, at tempo, and it would put in every single note and in, in the right um, pitch and the right time duration, and would put in any rests if you were to pause or hesitate. And it would be very fast. I would call it hyperscribe. However, if you're not a real good keyboard player, <laughs> you can you can put in some really wrong notes and and say you know if you hesitate just slightly, it will put a rest in. Uh, if you if your finger lingers on a key a little too long, well it will it will make that that note a little longer. Say you wanted it to be a quarter note, well it might dot it. And so you can go you can. Uh, you can get in a lot of trouble real fast if you're not a really accomplished keyboard player, but it's here if you are. Now, the next way of putting in notes would be uh, what they call speedy entry. And with speedy entry, you're going to use a combination of the mouse and cursor, and then you're gonna use um, keyboard shortcuts. So you're gonna use your alphanumeric and numeric keyboards to drop the notes in there. Now, though the problem is you have to have all of these memorized ahead of time. But once you get there, once you memorize them, say you were somebody, say your job was to just copy a lot of music, to take it from, say, a handwritten piece into this. And you did that all day, well, you would learn speedy entry. And so you would be able to go across and, and pop a lot of notes in there very fast. But the, what we're going to use today is something called simple entry. And with this, we're going to use this little toolbar over here. And so let's go ahead and get started.
So we, we know the melody. I, I, I've already picked out what the melody is. And so I know we're going to start off. And what I'm going to do just to show you how you would get feedback with, with the playback, I'm going to put in my melody. I'm going to put it in all quarter notes. And then we'll go back and change the time. So let's just take a quarter note. And remember, there's four of these to the bar. And so I'm going to put one in. We start on a, on a D. And you can hear it when you pop it in there. You can hear that it gives you that. And then the next one is going to be we're going to put in a B. Now, if you'll notice on finale, uh, as you go below the scale, uh, you've, you, it gives you these lines, these guides called ledger lines. And it will then you can, even though you're below the scale, it, it'll give you a, a good uh, reference point as to where, what that note is. It's only down one from the D and so forth on down. Now, usually you don't go too far down in, in the treble clef when you're doing the melody. You might go down about maybe three notes or so. But, but that's where you kind of pick up on, on another clef called the bass clef. And that has the notes arranged actually in reverse order going down. And so you can actually go, and the bass, the bass clef would be the left hand of the piano and the, and the treble clef would be the right hand of the piano. And you would start at this place right here with this guy that I've got shattered in called middle C. So this would be the middle of the keyboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop in this note, which is a B. And then we're going to put in another D, and then we're going to put in another B, all right, here, okay? And so the way the melody goes is, there's a place in Southern California. That's the, that's the, the, the melody. So we're going to drop it in a note. So we already, we already got the first bar. And then over here, I'm going to put in, and, and this is Southern, whoops. Now I put it there. I can just nudge it up right there. And then I can put this one in, and then this one here, California. So Fornia is, okay. So now let's kind of listen to what we put in so far. Oh, before we do that, we have to configure our playback. And this playback is done by, first of all, I go to this MIDI audio and I can either play playback through a MIDI keyboard or I can play it through Finale through virtual studio technology. And that's the VST which is about a hundred instruments that you can choose from. So I'm gonna say, I wanna do it in that. Now, if I want, it, it defaults to the Steinway piano and I'll show you that. If I look at the, the score manager, you can see that I'm now using these Garreton instruments for finale and it's using the Steinway piano. Now, if I want to use say a guitar, I can do that. I can just select um, say a plucked string instead of a strum string and an acoustic guitar and then my instrument will then be the acoustic guitar. So we'll set that up since this is, this is primarily a, 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 a guitar accompaniment uh, piece. And so now we've got all our notes in, we've got our playback. So let's do our playback and see what it sounds like. Not hearing anything. All right. Let's see. Okay, we've got that. That's in, I've got. You just love technology in moments like this? Uh, really, yeah. So I can't figure <laughs> out what's the problem. I spend half my day troubleshooting issues like this. It's okay, John. I know. We'll, we're here with you. Uh -huh. We, we can sing so it together. You know, I can, yeah, we can sing I can, it together. I can imagine what it sounds okay. like. <laughs> All right, here we go. You got it? No, no, not That's yet. Let's see if I can do it through another thing. <laughs> And John, if this isn't going to play ball with you. I have the uh, magic of the uh, internet at my side, too. I, I think yeah. I received an advanced copy of the, the completed song after it was fully cooked. So if we want, right. you know, let me we, know. We can listen to that later. All yeah. right. All what, right. I wanted show, what I wanted to show here, and I'm very disappointed it's not playing it. Um, let's see. Let me see my playback. Okay, I'm starting at the right place. And um, yeah, so um, I click and count off. I, I, um, I'm not gonna put any click in, I already had that. And then here, then here, then here. It's not doing, okay, let, let me look at this one more time. My score manager, how about if I come back to the, to the uh, let's come back to the keyboard and we'll look at our piano. 
Maybe it's just uh, it's pitched way too high. Maybe only certain certain animals can hear it right now. Yeah, yeah right. Could be. Could be the, what it is. Yep. So let's go back here to the keyboard and to this. And then so it changed. So now it's loading. I didn't really see it do this before. It didn't really load. I think uh, this might be the problem. Let's see if it comes in now. All right. Cross your fingers, everyone. The moment of truth. All right. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, I haven't had this problem before, and I've done this probably. Oh, it, here's my. It's all right. It wouldn't be a live experience if we didn't. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> I think I'm having a little problem with my computer here. All right. Let's Got your this. reminders on. Yeah, that's, I'm glad. Yeah, I got my reminders on. Make sure, you're, make sure you're present for this event. That's one. That's good. All right. Okay. All right. Let's let's, let's try it. No, it's no, not going to play. That's okay. I mean, that's I get funny. the idea of it. And, uh, okay, so, so you, it, you it, can it, play back, right? Right, <laughs> so right. If you want to. All right, so um, actually, we'll look at this. We'll drop a few more notes in. Uh-oh, I just had a crash here. Oh, that's probably why. We, we just completely yeah. crashed the, the system. Yeah. That's all so right. I tell you what, let's open it back up. We're going to open it back up, and we'll just talk for just a minute while we... You want to swing uh, us back around so we back. can see your lovely face, John? Yes. Okay. We'll do that. All right. Hey, okay. there's our there's our guest. We almost forgot what you right. look like. <laughs> I know. Yeah, you know, I've had this uh, program open uh, for a while, so so let me see um, what the problem is here. So, in addition, so, to, in, in addition, in addition to lead sheets, what what other work do you do? Is it mainly just that type of format that you work with? Primarily, yeah, because I just I will write a song and then I want to represent it, mm -hmm. and in a, in just a very simple way within my capabilities. And so I will, um, I'll just use that. And is, and this, is this, do you give this music to other artists or you distribute it to, is it mainly personal use or publishing use? What, what, where does it go from here? Well, you know, back in when I was younger, I used to uh, try to sell it a lot more and, mm -hmm. and uh, which I don't try anymore. Uh, I, after I went into my, my main career, I, um, you know, then I, after I retired, I wanted to go back into the music a little bit more. And so that's how I've kind of gotten back into it. But, um, okay, we're going to open back up the program and see. I don't know. I While you're getting there, uh, John, uh, one yeah. thing you mentioned earlier, and I'll just point out to uh, viewers, you had said at the bottom of your finale score, there's a space where you can put copyright John Denny or whomever right. the songwriter is. That does, uh, I mean, the actual law is the minute you write a piece of music or anything, it is your own, um, I can't remember the exact phrase, for, but it's copywritten. Yeah, but it's what, you're, what you're doing with Finale is wonderful because that song, that lead sheet in the form that you have it in is all you need to send to Library of Congress to get mm -hmm. your song copyrighted. There is a fee, uh, but uh, you send that or 10, 15, 20 songs in and uh, in that lead sheet form uh, and pay the fee and you'll get, uh, you'll get that copyright protection. Right, so I've got my program back up. Let's, let's see if I can uh, see if it's gonna work now. And what I'm thinking, John, in the interest of time, let's uh, look at how you were gonna adjust the beat okay. length of some of those notes. There's your... Okay, we're, we're up now. All okay. right, all <laughs> there, right. There's your click. Uh, right. And then uh, maybe add a few lyrics, and then maybe okay. we can jump yep. to the completed lead sheet. Yeah, so let's, let's go back to my, I think we're good now. Uh, I'm going to go back to my, my work in progress, which I, I didn't really uh, save, but um, and I don't know if it'll do anything, but let's, let's try to put uh, a few notes in. We'll go back over here and drop a few notes in and see if we can do it. Okay, so let's, we, we need to at least do the key. And we're in G. And now let's see if we drop in a note. Yeah, I can't understand why it didn't work because it was working as I dropped them in. You can and hear that. It's the magic of being. It, it's the magic of presenting something live in front of an audience. That's I, that's what, what so. causes things to, to right. malfunction. Really, I think so. And that's the that's where you get character, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> a little bit of finale stage fright, I think, going on. Okay, so so here's the four notes I dropped in. 
Okay, there's a place in, so you see how that's kind of boring. So what we would want to do is now that I can hear that, if, if I hadn't, if I didn't have the ability to play that back, uh, I, I really wouldn't know um, how that actually sounded because I don't have the skill level for, for, for timing like, like I should. Uh, so let's go back. Okay, so this song is actually written in kind of a long, short, long, short. And so I'll keep the first note, we'll keep as, as a, uh, a quarter note. And then I will then put in my next note as a eighth note. And then my next note, uh, we will put in as a, a quarter, but I wanna, I wanna hang on it just a little bit longer. So I'm going to put a dot on it. And a, a dot means uh, you, you're going to increase the value of this note by one half. And so where a quarter note has one beat, if I put a dot on it, now it has a beat and a half. And so now if we look at this, this has um, all, the, all four beats I need within my measure. I've got one, and then I've got uh, two quarter notes, and then this one is uh, three and a half, and then I've got an eighth note here that adds it up to be four. So now I've got my four, me my four beats per measure, but they're in all different uh, time notes except for these two. Okay, so let's just um, now hear what it sounds like. So now it's, there's a place in, so what I'm gonna do now, we've seen that, we've seen, and now let's, let's do chords. So let's put the, um, well actually, let's, let's go ahead and do the whole line here just so we can got it, get it, um, no, we'll just put one chord. And then I've got a completed manuscript I can go back and we can look at real quick as we are, we are um, almost out of time. So next thing we wanna put in is a chord. And so let's select this chord and let's put it right there. And I'm going to put in a G major chord. Okay. All right. Now you see it came up with the the regular fretboard that you would notice with a regular G chord. But I want to in this particular song, since it's about a place in Southern California, it's a primarily a, um, a acoustic guitar kind of piece. Well, I want to change it a little bit. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to edit the fretboard. And where I'm not, I'm going to add. I'm going to double up the D note here, and this will be this will kind of I, I kind of eagle it up a little bit. We're going to let this ring out a little longer, and then I can say okay. And now it changed my chord to that. And then um, if I want to set another chord, say let's let me go over here because I want to put a chord in here just to show you how you can put a chord if you don't have it in their library. Now right here, my next chord. It's going to be a C add nine. So I'll go C add nine. And it says, sorry, we don't have that chord in our library. Would you like to add it? And I'll say yes. And so that will be the suffix I'll be satisfied with. And I'll do this. And then I can actually edit the fretboard and put this chord in. And I can put in the, what I want to be the fingerings of this chord. And um, now that chord is in, this chord is in. So these are two new chords that Finale enabled me to put in. And we just look at this. So you can hear the chords are now playing. So what I'm going to do now in the interest of time is I'm going to close this guy down. And we'll say, uh, no, I'll change it. Okay, and this is my regular piece. Let's see if it'll play now. Whoop. We're going to take off the this click. The click is really good to help drive you to make sure that you're doing the correct amount of beats, uh, but it's a little sharp. And um, there's there's some Bill's going to teach me a, a, a workaround for that. But you can't lower the volume. Uh, so in fact, I went out on on a website and to see if you could you know lower the volume, and you cannot. You can you can lower the volume of all the other instruments. In fact, this has a built-in mixer. And so over here is, has got my um, acoustic guitar, and I can actually change the volume of that. If you had a bunch of instruments, you could change all of their, you could mix them in just like any other mixer. Okay, so here's our, here's our song as we play it through. And um, you can...
Okay, so we won't play through the whole thing because at the very end, um, I have a, a little recording I did with um, uh, with just my guitar and a little little extra. I'm not the greatest singer in the world, but I, I can um, hit most of the notes most of the time. So <laughs> I wanted to give you guys uh, kind of a, a feel for what an arrangement would be because yeah. um, a, a lead sheet is not an arrangement. A lead sheet is the essential elements. It doesn't have an intro. It doesn't have an outro. It doesn't have a bass line. It doesn't have anything uh, but the essential elements. So I kind of wanted to show you what this little thing, instead of this little plinking that you hear, which is mainly just feedback to make sure you put in the right notes in the right time. That's I was really going to give you a, a word of warning. If you were to give a lead sheet like this to a drummer like myself, everywhere you have a rest would be a you know huge drum fill. Isn't that, isn't that right, Mr. Bill? You know, if you want drum fills, put a lot of rest. Put a in lot of rests music. in it and give it to That's a drummer hard. and see what happens. We will we will well, fill see, up. That... We'll fill up those empty spaces for you, no problem. Well, that's why I put them in there because I knew that somebody would want them. <laughs> hey, John, yeah. uh, you've uh, you've done a tremendous job of showing us kind of the basic nuts and bolts of getting going in finale. I think uh, our viewers would all agree that there's, well, not just Finale, any music scoring program. And I would say, I think our uh, our viewers would agree that you can dive in pretty deeply in a program like this. What we didn't touch on, and we really are running out of time, but we didn't touch on how to enter the lyrics, which is a whole nother skill set in in these uh, programs. So I would suggest to anybody who uh, is a songwriter watching today, uh, BJ's going to wrap us up with some uh, some alternative uh, programs and uh, then play out uh, this song that John recorded and sent to BJ uh, and um, get yourself one of these programs and, and mm -hmm. dive in and start learning because it's a great way to get your material uh, tangible, if you will. You can print these, you can email these files, all the, all the tricks that we can do with the mm -hmm. internet uh, right. are wide open to these. So, John, I want to thank you. Uh, and uh, BJ, I think you're going to play us out. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you did mention a couple other uh, bits of software out there that, you know, if you have options. The only, I'm not, I, my, my knowledge of all the pieces of uh, software that are present, there's, there was a couple mentioned in the chat today uh, specifically for um, guitar notation. Uh, Brian uses Guitar Pro, uh, which converts... Uh, to notational manuscript that's a good one I wasn't aware of uh, and I recommended to one of the uh, viewers today about Muse score which I happened across because I too was looking for some uh, notation software to be able to use but I didn't want to I didn't want to commit to the price tag that finale or Sibelius uh, you can get with those I mean they have a very robust feature set uh, but I wasn't ready to kind of make that commitment to jump ahead to that um, so what I did was, uh, you know, I did a quick search. You know, you can do your own search out there and discover free notation um, pieces of uh, pieces of software. There, they come for the uh, smart devices. You can find them for, or your desktops, your regular computers. Uh, and MuseScore was the one that I came across, and I, I really like the feature set in that. And it has a pretty robust community of of users that uh, contribute to it and uh, help each other out. I'm assuming I'm pretty sure that Sibelius and Finale also have their own user communities. That if you had questions on, you know, can I do this with this piece of software? How does it work? Um, that you can also contribute to their support communities. I'll, I, I, that's the one thing I really love about. Um, being able to write now in the virtual landscape or on a digital landscape is now you have the opportunity to engage with um, communities and uh, support groups and collaborators. I mean, if if, um, if you know John were to give his piece of music to Mr. Bill and Mr. Bill is using the same piece of software, then they have the opportunity to write on the same piece of music. Whereas before, you know, um, I... I I don't even know how you would do it on uh, for, with pen and paper other than, you know, meeting in a coffee shop somewhere and sitting down together and pounding out the notes on a piano that, that might be present. So it's this, uh, I think, uh, you know, notation software and digital uh, compositions have really opened up the, the floodgates, uh, which these have been around quite a while. These have been, you know, Finale's been around since my days of college, which are, you know, more than a couple decades now. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's... it's uh, it's pretty amazing what what can be done with this type of software. So I, I, anybody who's watching, you know, go out there and explore. Especially if you have an interest in in what your 
song would sound like if you put it onto paper. You might be able to sing it in your head, but what does it look like, you know? And we did touch a, a, a little bit on some music theory today, a um, little intro music theory, which was fun, uh, very entertaining. But if you're also interested in that, we'd recommend uh, checking out some resources uh, in exploring music theory, what notation is, what time signatures and key signatures are. It's a, it's a vast, vast world. And uh, so... As we play out, I'm gonna I'm gonna load up John's song. Any last uh, thoughts today, John? Uh, no, it's just uh, I, I just wanted to say the, the finale. The way I got into finale was I had the the predecessor to it with the same company. It was called Songwriter, and it was it was much less expensive. And they discontinued Songwriter, and they said, "But we'll give you a, a upgrade to a finale for a very low price." So for about a, a third of the price of the retail price of able to get into Phenolic because it's the only choice. And, and all of my music I'd written in Songwriter was um, converting, converted into Finale. So, so that's how I got into it. I would probably never go out and pay the price for it today. <laughs> you never know how, there's always, there's always a way into it. There, I mean, that's, that's of the course. beauty of, of uh, the day and age we live in. There's, there's so many tools out there and chances are one of them will be right, right within the price range that you need it to be in with the features that you need to have. All right, John, well, I'm going to go ahead and load up your music and okay. let's take a listen, shall we? All right. There's a place in Southern California Filled with treasures from the days gone by You are welcome, but I have to warn you You are gonna need a lot of time We call her mom Sit at her table Feast on music, gaze out on the sea. On the sea. We call her mom. Ah, Come when you're able. You will love her, I can guarantee. You will love her just like Bill and me. It is. Wonderful. That was great. Oh, it's playing again. <laughs> All right. Once is enough. There's uh, a place. Awesome. That was really great. That's so fun to see how you can take a blank page and turn it into a really cool piece of music. I hope you guys are out there uh, want, are inspired. Be inspired today to try out uh, your own hand at, at writing music. You don't know what you're going to come up with. Um, and again, thanks for joining us today. We're going to be back on... Uh, Monday with another Museum Monday with our very own Dr. Jonathan Piper. Uh, what will we be talking about? I don't know, but it'll be a surprise. And then Wednesday next week, we have author Kathleen Kroll is going to be reading her book, M is for Music. It's a wonderful children's book. And then Friday, we're going to be doing some effects pedal exploration with our special guest, Henry Kaiser. He and Dr. Jonathan Piper are going to be talking about guitar pedals, a.k.a. stomp boxes, and all of the sonic diversity that you can achieve through those. So have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Mom at Home. Thank you again. Have a great weekend and take care.